one of these things where we, it, we were looking at it and we we're like, this can't possibly be right. They, we, we spent years, years building out these courses and they want the Google Docs instead? Every once in a while you do an episode where I do an episode where after the interview, I call Ian immediately and I have a breakthrough idea. It's a CIA episode today, the intrigue. I hope that you're like me. I hope you listen to today's episode and it inspires you to take action. The theme is simplicity. And something we've been talking about on the pod is that simple things aren't easy. Okay, so that's a downside. It'd be better if it was easy, right? They're not always easy. Simple doesn't equal easy. But one of the virtues of something simple is that often it's a little bit easier to see. You know, it might be oftentimes the simple things that are hard are personal things we have to overcome to do better in our business. Often they're difficult decisions. Sometimes they're just something that's a more straightforward path that exposes you to some pain that maybe a more complicated solution allows you to skirt around it. Whatever it is, today we have an amazing guest who's done a lot of thinking on the topic and has firsthand hard-won experience. His name is Tommy Griffith, and he recently wrote an amazing piece called Incredibly Difficult and Pointlessly Complicated. It outlines his experience of over a decade growing the online education product he co-founded as ClickMinded. In the piece, Tommy does a particularly good job of reflecting on the pomposity of advice in the Twitterverse. I often laugh at his tweets. I often laugh at Tommy. And I basically laughed the whole way through this interview. It's an incredible piece, and we've done our best to summarize it in podcast form for you here today with the man himself. But first, I want to set the scene a little bit. Tommy first came onto the show in 2017 to describe how ClickMinded grew out of a Saturday morning side hustle, teaching SEO classes at co-working spaces while he was working full-time in San Francisco, first at PayPal and then at Airbnb, where he was the head of SEO. And you're going to hear the hustle here. He mentions at the time he was still carrying some debt from some earlier failed side hustles. There was this moment where you know, I was still in a lot of debt, still trying to work it off, still trying to get feedback on the class. And someone emailed me, it was like my second or third class. So this guy emails me and his name is Philip Liu. He's this 55 year old Chinese dude. And he's like, I would love to learn SEO, but I can only, I'm only in town one day. And it turns out it was March 17th. It was St. Patrick's day. Also my 26th birthday. Philip's like, can you make time for this? And I'm sitting there, I'm thinking about it. It's, like, oh, it's my 26th birthday. It's $500. Fine, I'm in. I got, I've got so much debt. Like, I got to get through this. I'm in. Then he asked for a promo code. I'm like, God damn it. Then after I really crunched the numbers, it was awful. The revenue share on the co-working space was 50%. You know, I would buy a bunch of printed materials. I would buy the guy lunch. You know, I did a lot of work leading up to it. And so I'm sitting there on my birthday, St. Patrick's Day. There's like drunk people coming up on the window, like knocking with like green leprechaun hats, like having the best day of their life. And it's me and Philip Liu sitting in this tiny dark room talking about meta descriptions. <laughs> and I did have the math and I was making about $12 an hour teaching this guy. And San Francisco minimum wage was $13 an hour. So it was not good. So now let's catch up with Tommy and ClickMinded today and get into that blog post that I mentioned. So ClickMinded started as a side project about 10 years ago. It has now morphed many, many times from, a, from kind of a, an offline course, just about one type of internet marketing, search engine optimization, moved to an online course, moved to a suite of online courses. And now we've kind of become like a, a white label documentation company. A lot of marketing teams and agencies and things like that use us to optimize their processes, onboard clients, all the back end boring, you know, sort of documentation that you might do behind the scenes. That's the stuff that we do. The stuff that you would hire an intern for and make them work on on the weekends and order them like mediocre pizza and Chinese food to get it done. That's the kind of stuff that we do for our customers. What was like the emotional hook in you that, that pulled you to the, the quill, so to speak. Every chance I had to make a decision in my business, I took the difficult path for no reason. <laughs> and 
once I sort of let go a little bit and got out of the way, it just became painfully obvious to me. And the, the reoccurring theme that kept coming up in my life is this meme, the, the IQ bell curve meme. I don't know if you've seen it. It's also let's called describe like describe what it looks like meme. Let's talk, let's talk about yeah, what I it looks like and we'll put it on the blog post as well. Cause I, it's one of my favorite <clears throat> memes as well. The, the basic idea is, and this is very kind of internet culture heavy and like, like Reddit message board fighting heavy, but the basic idea is dumb people and smart people often come to the same conclusion, even if it's for different reasons. So I wrote a little about it in this post. I said, this meme is used to convey that dumb people use a simple solution because they're dumb. The average people <laughs> use a complex solution because they think they're smart. And smart people use a simple solution because they're smart. And I think for me, I found myself that midwit, that average mediocre guy who just overcomplicates everything. I found myself doing that in like every category of my life. And when I kept seeing that meme running around the internet, I'm like, I would laugh at it. And then I'd be like, wait, this isn't funny because that's, that's me. <laughs> this is me for everything. Do you want to go through some of the examples that are like baselines and not about you, but some of the more popular applications of this meme? We're also talking about polarization. So like taking a middle road can often be less simple than going to an extreme. Yeah, sure. I mean, like, like the starting a business one, right? Like if you were to go out and start Googling around on entrepreneurship and how to start a business, the midwit person is going to say things like seed funding, thought leading, tweet storming, hiring VAs, getting a Brex credit card, doing a TEDx keynote, right? <laughs> but like the dummy <laughs> and the genius, they, what they focus on is like make something people want. Right. With investment stuff, it's like the midwit average mediocre person is like, you know, options, crypto, gold, SPACs, meme stocks, hedging, all weather portfolio, covered straddles, angel investing, micro PE. But the dummy and the genius, it's like buy the S&P 500. Right. <laughs> and so fitness, right? Atkins, keto, paleo, vegan, whole 30, fasting, CrossFit, soul cycle, hot yoga, glucose monitoring. And like... The dummy and the genius that's like, eat less and move more, you know? So this just like, oh, this is my other one. Productivity tools. This one's hilarious. Asana, Trello, Notion, Rome, Evernote, ClickUp, Second Brain, Zapier, Pomodoro timers, Moleskin notebooks. <laughs> and the dummy and the genius, it's like notepad.txt, right? Or Apple Notes, you know? And so <laughs> the vast majority of people don't don't need to overcomplicate it. And it's just, it's just really funny seeing the entry level noob, you know, crow magnon dummies doing the same things that the Jedi's are doing with 10 years experience and getting the same results. And that theme just keeps showing up in my life. I'd like to talk about click minded as a, a framework for some of these ideas. It looks like you started out as a dummy in 2012, making $11,000 a year, and you ended up a genius selling $2.3 million worth of product just last year. But I think what you're flagging up is if it, it feels like you took 10 years to do it. And not only did it take 10 years to do it, but I did everything in my power to make it happen as slow and as painful as, as possible. Every mistake I could have made, I made. The root of the story is we had all these online courses and we made this side product called our SOP library. And the basic idea was a couple of people were taking the courses and they were saying, this is great, but I'm still unclear how to get started. And so we said, all right, you know what? Let's make this, we have this library that we created for ourselves, which is all of our digital marketing SOPs, how to add Google Tag Manager to a Squarespace website, how to run a MailChimp campaign and reduce 99% of errors, how to set up conversion events in Google Analytics, these very dorky, straightforward SOPs. And we said, let's open this up to users. And if they sign up for a course, we'll give them like access to this for free. It was a side product. It was hard to find it on the sites. The, the, the pricing on it was, was a little bit weird. It was not the main thing we were doing. And our users were like badgering us for months and years about this product. They were asking for updates to it. They were asking how they could buy it. They were asking for access with their team. They were saying, do I have to sign up for the course? I don't want the course. I just want the SOPs. And for two years, we were like ignoring this. Why would we you ignore so, it? I think it was, it was arrogance. We had this, this idea that we were an ed tech company, 
that we were creating these online courses. I think there was also some sunk cost fallacy going on. I mean, we had 85 hours of HD videos, seven instructors, some universities I were remember using that our project. courses. Yeah, I it mean, you big. had the lettuce, the logos, you had the whole thing, yeah. And universities were using us as part of their course curriculum. Fortune 500 companies were using us to onboard employees. The, the, the product was great. We were super proud of it, and, and it, it took a lot of work to do. So the fact that people were saying, actually, can I just pay for all of these Google Docs? <laughs> it was it was a little hard to face that music, Dan. I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, it's it was it, it was just one of these one of these things where we, it, we were looking at it and we we're like, this can't possibly be right. They we we spent years years building out these courses and they want the Google Docs instead, right? And the key to unlocking everything was our now CEO Andre who started off as an Upwork contractor. So let's, let's clarify, because you gave a great presentation about a late co-founder, and we've talked about that, this idea that a great way to grow your team is to bring on, to have someone vest into the company after you know what you need and not from the very beginning because two buddies had an idea in a coffee shop. But now we're not talking about the late co-founder. We're talking about a CEO that you brought in after the fact. So yeah, I had this sort of process I went through to bring on a late co-founder year five into my business, brought him on board. And then basically four years later, my co-founder and I did the same thing again with, with a CEO where, where we basically said, okay, now neither of us is capable. <laughs> Let's do this again and bring on someone else who's ready for, who's ready for the, the next leg of growth. I know what it feels like to show up to a job board and understand that whatever price you're going to pay and whatever amount of time you're going to spend writing that job ad, that's just a fraction of the whole deal. Hiring takes a ton of time and money, especially if you get it wrong. That's why in 2023, we've created a more affordable way for you to work directly with our experienced recruiters to help you get the result and the hire you're seeking. Check out our new service. It's called Guided Hire, and it starts at just $14.97. With Guided Hire, an experienced team member on our team will help you determine a hiring strategy and promote it to the best candidates, even if they're not on our own job board. Dynamite Jobs will help you track them down and hand deliver and filter for you only the very best applications. Our recruiters are executing this best in class strategy all day, every day with great results. In fact, last year, we've made over 100 direct hires. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. Let me just read some of these. Our recent hire, senior designer in Colorado, a full stack engineer in Kosovo, technical support in Hungary, technical project manager in Dominican Republic, all kinds of jobs, all kinds of locations, all kinds of salaries. Check out our team at remotefirstrecruiting.com. We can help run the strategy for you and guide you to the result you seek. So save time, get expert support, and execute a world-class hiring strategy for every single hire. Head on over to Remote First Recruiting com and give the team a call. Tell me about how you found your CEO. So we found Andre in 2017 through Upwork of all places. And Upwork is, for anyone who isn't familiar, is a freelancer marketplace. Andre had just started his digital nomad journey. And he did what a lot of people do, which is he quit his job and set up an Upwork account. And the very first job was this very menial data entry cleanup job that my co-founder posted on Upwork. And Andre came in and it was like bringing a, bringing a rocket launcher to a one-year-old's birthday party. He was like so overqualified. It was, it was unbelievable. And we just ended up working with him for very kind of menial stuff over a long time horizon. And for years, he was like a 10 hour a week employee who had a lot of strong opinions and loved the product. He was very much like us. He was very nerdy about digital marketing. He had this other job that was paying well and that he liked, but he just kind of like liked our product and liked being around us and sort of stuck around for many years. Eventually, he was the one who sort of noticed like, hey guys, you're doing this all wrong. If people are screaming for this product, the, the, the courses should be the second place thing. I'm actually doing this already at this other business. I'm running these Facebook ad campaigns. It's pretty similar. Like, here's what you should do. And we, we ignored him for, for a year or two. 
we finally got out of his way. We finally let him implement his own strategy and the business exploded. You have some examples of complications, which I think are hilarious. The let's do consulting phase, the let's sell to big companies phase, the let's create our own SaaS phase. Let's have a webinar for everything phase. Let's make an exception for everyone phase. Let's do a joint venture for every. Let's pretend we're a real company and hire a PR. Oh my God, this is so good. H hitting a little too close to home over I there for you, pal, or what do we got? <laughs> oh man, it's just landing. Let's offer an apprenticeship phase. This is complicated management. Let's hire a CEO phase. Let's acquire 10 other businesses phase. The white knight, a bearded man from Portugal. You're speaking about your new CEO, but how is this just not like the 14th experiment and the 14th experiment hit. So there is a theory out there that I sort of subscribe to is like you, you buy a hundred domains and you put up a project and you like come on a podcast you, or you go to a team meeting and you talk about web, webinar to hiring funnel or whatever I'm going to, my media <laughs> strategy is this, this month. And the idea is that like 5% of them are going to hit. You know, and so the, the concept is just like, we'll get to the next plan a little bit faster. Why isn't your CEO just that next 5% plan versus something that you should have recognized earlier? Yeah, it's a good question. And I actually talked about this in the post to some degree. I mean, it's pretty reasonable to say, look, every company has R and D. Every company has to make experiments. You're not going to be handed the strategy from God. Otherwise that's not how business works. You have to test and fail. They have to be part of the process. But for us specifically, it was so painfully obvious because it was in our user base and our data and our help support tickets every day. We had people who were going out of their way to find the contact form and say, Hey, I want this thing for the love of God, please. Will you, can I please pay you for this? Did they Works. say exactly that Tommy, or was Listening it, was it something it. approximating that? It was approximating that you're right. That's fair. It was approximating that. And it was a general interest in the thing. Can you um, be specific? Because like, what if your customers are asking you for things that even though they want them, like aren't smart business moves to make. One of the problems I have, Tommy, is, is sometimes I'll get like customer requests and the way I process them will be as like a cost. Like they're asking me for something that even though they want it, it's like not strategically smart to do it. You're right. Because just getting the emails from people doesn't necessarily mean you need to go in and, and do this thing. What ended up being our situation was users were bending over backwards to get into this product, asking for updates to it, asking for additional seats to it, giving us these very heavy signals that like they were using this thing above and beyond what it was designed for, which was a bonus for this core product. It was a sweetener to push some people over the finish line for the core thing. And in, in, in hindsight, the evidence was piling up that they were actually using the bonus more than the, the core thing. You're right. That does not translate perfectly to this is going to be a massive revenue generator. This is going to be a high margin thing. But the path it did lead us down to was, oh, my God, there's lots of other people out there that need this. And what it led us to do was take that product, retrofit it for cold traffic audience, significantly lower the price and find lookalikes of those people. And that's what ex exploded the business. So it was not like, oh, these users really want this. Let's cross sell and upsell them. It was, this is a good signal that there's millions of people like this. People running, you know, two to 50 person agencies and consultancies, marketing teams of 10 or less. And they need 50 different SOPs on Google Tag Manager and Google Analytics and how to share access to your Wix website. And we could be the central repository for the backend operations of every digital marketing agency and consultancy in the world. And the, the seeds of that idea was our users finding our contact form and saying, this is out of date. Can I add a user? Can, and they were just sort of like bubbling up, but we were so kind of arrogantly focused on this, you know, 
we're ed tech. We're going to be, you know, Coursera is going to acquire us. We're the general assembly clone. Like grad school should shut down and bow in our presence because we're going to eat them alive. It was this sort of like, like very self-obsessed vision we had and sunk cost fallacy we had for, for how we got to that moment that we, it just led us, led us to not really opening our eyes and, and testing. And, and to build on that even more, the, the hilarious part about this was we would have figured it out with a $100 three-day test. We could have very quickly put it in the yes-no category if we had been a little bit more thoughtful about it. So you're right. It's, this does not mean follow up on every single customer email you get and assume it's going to be a, a revenue generator. But the exception for us is that like the evidence was pretty clear that we should have done this for, for a long time before we did it. What sort of changes can you guys make so that it doesn't end up being like this in the future? Is it a personality thing? Is it a process thing? Is it an organizational culture thing? Because I mean, I, part of me feels so seen by your article, you know, like I'm struggling with all sorts of things that, that you mention here and I'm wondering what I can do with the message. I mean, maybe this is part of the game. Maybe this is why my sort of subconscious wanted me to write this article so I could get some answers to it myself. I, I don't really know. I mean, the one other big takeaway I had from all this, and I, and like, I don't know how to fix the future behavior, but it was this idea of the guy who founded Tiny, I think it's Andrew Wilkinson. I love a lot of the content he's put out and some of the podcasts he's been on, but he had this, this like the like the post says relentlessly simple tweet from a couple of years ago which is like i can't believe it took me this long to figure out for hiring but when you're hiring someone find someone who's done exactly what you want to do and hire them like don't hire for raw talent don't make it complicated the figure out the thing you want find someone that's done it before and then hire them if you want to get fancy Find someone that's done it at a company that's a little bit bigger than yours, but that's not even necessary. <laughs> you read that and you're like, it can't be that simple. It can't be that simple. There's no way it's that simple, right? But that is exactly what happened with Andre. He was working at a SaaS company, ran their Facebook ads campaigns and their paid advertising campaigns and, and turned them into a seven-figure business overnight and did the exact same thing. Lowered the price, cold traffic, ad landing page offer. And for two years, he was like, hey, guys, hey, hey, I've done this before. It'll work. It'll definitely work. Stop doing the course thing. Let me know if you want to do it. And we were like, no, 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 no. We're going to do the more complicated, horrible two years of wasting our lives first. Thanks. We'll let you know when we're ready. It grew our business 300% in 2021. I know you haven't been the CEO for a long time, Tommy, but how does that change your relationship to the business? Do you have the final say because you're the founder, the original founder, and what does the next year look like as you pursue increased Zen-like simplicity in your, your business <laughs> trajectory? It's been so fun. If you, if anyone's listening, who started a business and you're thinking about trying to give up control to someone else, I highly recommend it. I feel like a proud parent right now. <laughs> I've the coolest thing in the world. It's watching other people care about something that you made. And at this point now, people on the team have added to, created, and contributed to the site like more than me, which is weird. We have hundreds of, I, I wrote like the first one or two SOPs, and now we have hundreds of them that weren't written by me. Yeah. I wrote the first, you know, five or 10 blog posts, and now we have hundreds of them that weren't written by me. I did the first thousand customer support emails. And so... That's really cool. In terms of like final say and all that, it, it, it's it been really informal. And maybe this isn't a good answer, but I the reason why I brought my co-founder on board was because he's better than me. And then the reason why we brought Andre as the CEO on board is because he's better than the two of us. And in general, what that should usually mean is like you're, you want them to make judgment calls on things. So... If it really came down to it, I mean, we'd, we'd, we'd probably figure out a way, but I, I almost always cede to their decision and sort of let them do it because we, we almost always end up wanting the same thing, being in the same place, being on the same page. It's like the little differences 
have ended up being, it was tougher at first, but the little differences end up being very small and not worth, not worth fighting about. So I almost always take a back seat to, to both of them. We're rounding out our hour here. This idea that simple isn't easy. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about why that in particular resonates with you. Yeah, this guy, he tweeted this out and it blew my mind. Zach Cantor, he correlated two books that make no sense together. <laughs> one was <laughs> The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up by Marie Kondo. Did you read this one or hear about this one? It's a Netflix no. show now. And then The No Rules Rules by the Netflix co-founder, Reed Hastings. So these, these two books, right? The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, it's this, she's this Japanese personal organizer. And it's the, the, it's this big book and it's a Netflix show, but the whole thing can be summed up in one sentence, which is throw away everything you don't love. And then this Netflix book, it's the same thing. It's this big, like, you know, HR management, startup culture kind of thing, but it can be summed up in one sentence, which is fire your B players. Fire B and C players, right? That's it. And those two concepts are very simple. But it does not mean they're easy. And the point that this guy made in this tweet where he's comparing these two very unlike books, they're both the same thing, which is like everyone picks up the book and they say, throw away everything you don't absolutely love. I'm like, oh, ha -ha, okay, well, I'm not going to do that, but let's keep reading and see what it says, right? And with the Netflix thing, it's like, okay, fire all your B players and pay your A players more. And it's like, well, I, I'm not going to do that, but let's keep reading and see what they say. That's simple, but not easy. And this kind of relentless simplicity idea, I just keep seeing these sort of concepts show up in my life where just because it's simple, it doesn't mean you're done now. It's actually quite hard. Eat less and move more. That's simple, but I can, as someone who loves ribeye steak, I can tell you that that's not that easy, right? And so like, like a lot of these concepts, even though I do think being relentlessly simple is the right way to do it. It can still be pretty hard. And so you do have to keep that in mind. I love this message. And one other thing while I had Tommy on the phone, I wanted to ask him about location and specifically New York City. Why, for example, at this moment in his life, after many years of nomading in Asia and the U.S., has he chosen to base himself in New York City? Recently, we were talking, we shouted you out on the, on the pod, I believe so, where you had mentioned that New York City is really one of the most underrated destinations for digital nomads, for entrepreneurs. If I think about like the last 10 or 15 things I've heard from entrepreneurs about New York City, it's basically like, if you're young and broke, yes. If you're our age and you're totally freaking loaded, yes. Everyone else, just leave. And so with that as a context and, and also this kind of background idea that I think it's like commonly recognized that in our community, and I don't know if, if you think this is true, like you need to make like huge money to live in New York. Well, so it's interesting. I mean, I've only, I've only now been here for a year and a half. And I found when I was like nomading, I found when I was younger, I was incredibly arrogant. I always thought that whatever I was doing at exactly that moment was the best possible thing you could do. And everyone else that wasn't doing what I was doing was an idiot. Like <laughs> I left San Francisco and now I'm in Bali and I'm hanging out here and it's this amazing place and there's coconuts on demand. And if you're not in Bali, you're a moron, right? That's the way I kind of I live my life. And then I moved on to the next thing. I thought, oh, everyone in Bali's an idiot. Why would you be living there? A bunch of hippies doing yoga, this, that. Really the move is Honolulu, right? And so it goes on and on and on. So. I'm happy to like upsell New York and talk about how great it is, but I reserve the right to completely change my mind a couple of years from now when I'm absolutely miserable and, and over the place, if that's, if, if that's oh, cool gotcha. with you. <laughs> but with that, with that out of the way, yeah, it is. I mean, when, when I hear the word digital nomad, the first thing I think is like a lot of the stuff that you and Ian used to talk about in the early days, which is like quit your nine to five baseline, lower your expenses. And when you, when you talk about those costs sort of optimizations, New York is just at the bottom of the list. It's inexpensive. But if you're in a different phase where you're more interested in meeting people, trying new stuff, changing it up a little bit, I don't know how to ex explain it other than getting your, your heart rate up a little bit. For that, it has been so awesome. I lived in 
San Francisco for a very long time. And it was a little bit monotonous in that I, I love my work and I loved what I did, but everyone I met was doing the exact same thing. Everybody looked like me, everybody, you know, it was all tech all the time. Where'd you go to school? What are you working on? What company do you work for? And in New York, there is, there, that isn't a thing. You can, you can hang out with people who are on every, at every phase of life, everywhere, all the time. And for me right now, I really like that. How much money do you need to be making to live in New York City? It is an expensive place. I'd never heard that, that formulation you'd said before, which is you either need to be dirt poor or super wealthy, <laughs> which is kind of interesting because I, I, I do sort of get that. It does depend on your standards. Are you, I mean, are you comfortable being a guy in your mid to late thirties with roommates? Like I, you, if, if you are, you, you, you can make it. If not, you might have to have, be a little bit more established, right? Are you comfortable being on the train for an hour to get to anywhere you want to go? It, there's a lot of stuff where it, you're paying for convenience sort of every day of your life. For me, part of the reason why I'm here is because I, it's not that congruent, consistent thing. There isn't actually a, a, a plot and a story and like in a beginning and an end. There was that in San Francisco. I, I felt that. I mean, I moved there right at the end of 2010 and you could feel this kind of massive sort of like everyone getting on board and like like this sort of shift kind of happening. I felt that like when I would when I left that city and I started nomading around and I remember like in in all of the co-working spaces I was in in Southeast Asia, everyone suddenly dropped everything that they were doing and they were like working on crypto right around 2017. Like I, you sort of feel I, I wasn't I wasn't doing any of that, but you could sort of feel people like all moving that way. In New York, it, it's not that. There's not that consistent story. I run a digital marketing training business. All of my team is remote. I love nerding out on tech stuff. But a couple of weeks ago, I signed up to be an extra on, on an HBO show. <laughs> the week before that, I went to see a Broadway play, right? The week, a couple of months ago, I, I went surfing with my buddy at Rockaway Beach, right? Like it's, a, it's an incredibly kind of like... Naval, I, I, of course, I'm going right to Naval Ravikant right away. I shouldn't have done that, but I love this guy. I love citing this guy. But I remember he had this, he had this, it was either a speech or a podcast appearance he did where he talked about how we all kind of intuitively know that people are like multivariate. And he, he talked about, I think it was the Romans or the Greeks, how over the course of someone's life, like you were a child and then you became a soldier and you went to war and then you came back and you like opened up a business and then you like went to the Senate and you were a politician and you had these like seasons in life or, or phases in life. And I'm getting kind of excited about that. Now I'm sort of realizing that like my story doesn't have to add up or make sense because, because they never do. And this sort of idea of like, you studied accounting and accounting school, and now you're going to be an accountant for 40 years. Or like you moved to the city and like your story has to, has to add up. And everyone in this one city is doing the same thing. I'm, I'm just, I'm not convinced that that's real anymore. And I, and because of that, I think I'm very happy with being in this bizarre mash of people going in wildly different directions and just like waking up every day and sometimes picking a different direction. You know, it's been, it's been kind of fun. <laughs> I was thinking like, you know, New York is often, yeah, like in the tech space, say it's, it's all about money. It's all about this. It's all about that. But like, when I think of what actually happens in New York for me, it's something like, the person next to you in line more than anywhere else I've, you know, in the English language I've experienced is, is more likely to have like a sharp thought about something, even if they're not an intellectual or not a professional, they're more likely to have a very incisive insight or sharp thought, you know, this, I feel like there's a conversational quality, a nature to the ideas that you're, you encounter in New York. That's, very different than anywhere else I've ever been. It, it is funny though, the, how direct I, I had been told when I first moved to the West coast, I had been told by friends and loved ones that I was a little bit too direct. And I, and I grew up in a, in the suburbs, but, but on the East coast. And I, I heard this kind of East coast, West coast sort of difference. And I come to New York and it's, it's a huge relief how direct everyone is. You know, someone, someone's walking in front of me and they're super slow and I'm sitting there like rolling my eyes thinking like, oh my God, get out of the way. And before I can even say anything, six other people are like, get the f out of the way, right? <laughs> like, like, they're like, they're like doing it for me. You know, and I'm like, 
These are my people. They're, these people are bigger psychos than me. This is great, right? But, but, but there's, I, I, do, I do love that. I think because it's such a tough place, people are, people are actually quite warm. And there's these really funny moments. The funniest New York moments are when you suddenly become friends with strangers for a very short period of time because of like something happening with no obligation and then you never see them again and it happens all the time like something some crazy person's walking around or there's a car crash or something happens and you just kind of like you suddenly become friends with everyone that you're around you're like are you seeing this like, like you're this part of the avengers you, all of a sudden yeah a, a little bit yeah and then it's like oh my god anyways i'm out of here see you later see you never right it's just kind of this like sort of sort of <laughs> shared struggle that is incredibly hard to replicate anywhere else. So for at least for the time being, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Tommy Griffith, thanks for joining us on the TNBA pod. We always appreciate it. Thanks for writing the article. Dan, thanks so much for having me. Big shout out to Tommy Griffith, co-founder of ClickMinded for coming by the show. It's always a real pleasure to talk to Tommy. It's one of my favorite all-time podcasts, as well as uh, in-person speakers. You can always tell his story in a way that for me is very relatable. In fact, like I mentioned at the top, I've taken a lot from this episode and trying to implement it. Simplicity in business. What do you think? Sounds easy, but sometimes it's pretty damn hard. Let me know. Dan at tropicalmba.com is the email. That's it for this week. We'll be back next Thursday morning, as always, 8 a.m. Eastern time. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.